Welcome back to Face the Nation. We're back with Michael Morrell, former Deputy CIA Director, and Tom Donilon, former National Security Advisor to President Obama. Mike, let me start with you. The President said this week uh, that the talks between the North and South in Korea are the result of his hard pressure. Do you buy that? I think what the North Koreans are doing, John, is reaching out to the South for two reasons. One is um, to divide the United States and South Korea. This is a long-term strategy on the part of Seoul, and this is just another example of it. The second is they are looking for some economic gains here. They are hurting as a result of the sanctions, and they'd like to come to some arrangement with the South Koreans where they get something for being more positive. On the South Korean side, they're being receptive because they're concerned about the tough rhetoric in Washington. They're concerned about war, and they don't want that to happen. Tom, what do you make of the president's tweet about nuclear weapons? Yeah, I agree with Mike's analysis on the on the uh, on the North coming. I think they are under pressure, and the sanctions are starting to bite. On the tweeting on nuclear weapons, um, no president should talk about nuclear weapons in a cavalier fashion. It's it's a it's a really decidedly bad topic for tweeting, frankly. Uh, you know, since the dawn of the nuclear age in August of 1945. Every president has sought to speak in the most precise terms about nuclear weapons and the circumstances under which the United States might use them. Since the dawn of the nuclear age, presidents have endeavored to speak about nuclear weapons separate from conversations about regular weapons, right, that we might use. Peggy Noonan had a really good column in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, which I encourage your viewers to take a look at, where she said that this could destigmatize, right? It leads to a destigmatization of the of the use of nuclear weapons, which is not in the, our national interest. Every president since John F. Kennedy has sought to make the use of nuclear weapons less likely rather than more likely. We've been lucky uh, over the course of the, whatever, 72 or 73 years. And it's, it's a result of care and precision uh, and really a consciousness of, the, of what these weapons are about. Uh, and we really shouldn't press our luck. So it's a, it's, a, it's a profoundly bad topic for Twitter. My last point on this is I would encourage the White House staff. I know that General Kelly has said that he doesn't pay attention to the president's Twitter account. Uh, that's a mistake. These are presidential statements, and the world pays attention. Uh, and I would encourage them to have a national security carve-out if they could ever achieve it with the president to say, these are the kinds of things you need to get advice on. These are the kinds of things you should sit with your advisors on and do in a much more precise, conscious fashion. Mike, though, the CIA director said, no, this is perfectly in keeping with the U.S. policy, which is if it looks like the president is, you know, uh, ready to go, then that helps put pressure on, on the Koreans and, and even the Chinese, too. And so, John, I couldn't agree more with what Tom said, and I would just add that uh, people often defend the president on this by saying he's keeping our adversaries off balance, right? From a tactical perspective, that's something you want to do on the battlefield, for example. Strategically, you want just the opposite. You want great clarity at, in terms of what the United States wants, um, what its red lines are, and what we're willing to do about what we want, right? And this is a strategic issue. So you want great clarity from the president, not, not things that raise questions about what we will or won't do. Tom, what do you make, uh, moving over to Iran, what do you yeah. make of the protests and, and how should we think about those? Yeah, a couple of things. One is that uh, I think the protests in some respects um, reflect uh, failed expectations, right, uh, by the Iranian people. Uh, the director of the CIA was right. They're different in kind uh, uh, in geography from the uh, protests in uh, 2000, 2009. It is out in more rural and outside the big cities. Um, but, you know, the nuclear deal put pressure on the regime to deliver. Right, mm -hmm. uh, on economics. That was the promise that President Rouhani made. Uh, and they haven't been able to live up to that, and that's, I think, somewhat of the cause for, for this. This is also internal politics. You know, in general, to one quick thing on this, you know, the, we do have a situation here where the president has to decide this week whether he's going to continue waiving the sanctions as part of the nuclear deal. Uh, all the objective observers indicate that Iran is complying with and we're getting the, what we wanted out of the nuclear deal, which was a transactional approach to put a lid on there and uh, roll back and stop their nuclear, uh, the nuclear program. For the United States to pull out, we'll only isolate ourselves, right? And it will make us the issue as opposed to Iranian behavior the issue. Mike, let me ask you that question. How does the U.S. calibrate um, putting pressure on an author authoritarian regime, but now, on the other hand, not becoming a thing that they can use to rally, right. you know, look at the bad, the United right. States? Let me just add, I think that these are the most significant protests in Iran since the revolution in 1979. I think they're more significant than, than, than 2009, which was limited in geography, as Tom said, 
it was limited to those people who were already ideologically opposed to the regime. This is much more geographically spread, and these are the supporters of the regime. These are the supporters of the supreme leader. These are the supporters of Rouhani, right? So this is fundamentally different. Um, there, and, 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 and 2009 was about an election. This is about economic opportunity. This is about corruption. This is about the regime itself. So this is very significant, right? In terms of what we do yeah. going forward, um, I think we have to speak out for freedom in general because we want to send a message to the rest of the world, but I think we have to be extremely careful about how we do that because there is nobody inside of Iran who, who wants U.S. interference in Iran, right? So I, whatever we do, I think we need to be careful, and I think we need it to do it with our allies and partners. All right, we're going to have to end it there. Tom, Thank Mike, thanks so much. Thank and we'll be right back with former Governor Haley Barber. Stay with us. We're joined now by a very familiar figure here in Washington, former Mississippi Governor Haley Barber, also a former head of the Republican National Committee. Governor Barber, welcome back to the broadcast. What do you make of this book, Fire and Fury? Uh, I, I suspect a lot of it's not true or is exaggerated. I hadn't read it, don't intend to, but uh, it, it, it just strikes me as President Trump's very unpopular in Washington. He's very unpopular with the liberal media elite and that this story just kind of plays to, to those prejudices. And yet the president's reaction has been to go right at this book. You know about politics. Why would a president uh, basically put at the center of the conversation um, his competency by responding in the way he has? Hasn't he added a bunch of days to this story? Well, I think if we look back through the year, the, the president is uh, more likely to respond to things than most presidents have been. Yeah. And this is just another case of that. What's your sense of the way things are going to work out in the politics this year? In 2018, you've got a lot of congressional elections. How, what's the landscape look like to you? Well, I think the, the biggest thing is the economy. Uh, we had very slow economic growth in the Obama administration. We averaged 2.1 percent a year of GDP growth, where over the, since World War II we've been averaging 3.1 percent. So think about in the heartland, the economy had been growing half again faster. Mm -hmm. Well, now under Trump, we are above 3 percent. Obama never had a year where economic growth was 3 percent. If the economy grows and if people recognize not only the tax bill is going to put more money into the private economy and less money into the government, also what he has tried to do and is successfully doing in terms of regulatory reform to again take costs off of business where they can spend more money on hiring people, giving raises, uh, on investing, uh, I think that's the big thing for Trump. But it's not only getting good results, it's getting credit for the good results. But well, and, that, and you say it's just the media elite doesn't like uh, President Trump, but his approval ratings suggest that there are people outside of that group that, that have some issues with him. And you, you've seen the generic ballot on asking sure. Democrats and Republicans. Those are not great signs for Republicans going into election well, year. Well, of course you're not. I have to say, let's don't act like the public is not affected by right. what the media tells them they're supposed to be thinking. Well, now in the Hillary Clinton election, it turned out that the public decided they were going to go in a different direction from what the media was telling them. But Trump has to live with that. The Republicans have to live with that. He is not going to get all of a sudden popular with the liberal media elite. That isn't going to change. Should Republicans run with the president? They want him coming to their district? In midterm elections, Republicans, Democrats, whomever, every candidate ought to run for their state, whether they run for governor, for senator, for congressman, for their district, on their issues their campaign against their opponent's campaign. And if I were the Democratic, former Democratic national chairman, I'd give them the same advice. The president said he's not going to campaign uh, for any challengers to incumbents. Um, what do you make of that decision? That would be typical. I mean, I was political director of the White House for Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan didn't take sides in Republican primaries, period. But he certainly would have never gone out and campaigned against an incumbent Republican. It would have been just foreign to, to his experience in politics. So I don't think there's anything unusual about that. The, um, you know, let me ask you about that political director part. You've seen an inside of a White House. President Trump came to Washington. He was going to do things differently. And this Michael mm -hmm. Wolf book, let's leave that aside. 
it doesn't come out of nowhere. There's a context. This is a president who's doing things differently. Um, based on your experience in being inside politics, I mean, it, it goes too far to say that this is a White House that's just like every other one. I mean, there are some rough edges to it. And the question from, that I'm asking you is, given your experience, how are people to, to evaluate those rough edges? Well, first of all, a lot of what he's trying to do is hard. We just passed the tax reform bill, the biggest tax reform bill since 1986. It happened. I was political director for the White House in 1986. It took us more than two years. And we had Democrat support from the beginning. When President Reagan announced his tax reform package in the spring of 1985, the Democrat response was given by Danny Rostenkowski, the chairman of Ways and Means, who said, the Democrats are for tax reform, too. And we want to work with the president. We don't agree on everything, but we want tax reform. Still took us to the end of 86. So that they got this done in one year, I think, is remarkable. I had been saying, I don't believe you can get it done that fast. Let me ask you about putting together a bipartisan position on immigration. You've encouraged your party to, you've, you've said we're not going to deport 12 million people and we shouldn't. Uh, where is that issue with the Republican Party now, given that President Trump it ran and is continuing to govern as somebody who's being very tough on, on undocumented yeah, I, immigrants? I think in the Obama administration, if they had tried, they could have passed, instead of putting DACA in, ex, in effect by executive order, I think they could have passed some immigration reform, and it fell apart not because of people's bad intentions or anything, but you remember when all those children came up from Central America and that made some people afraid of, of that issue at the time. But it, it fell apart but because the, the Senate passed it, but then the House couldn't. Well, because of what happened, you know, because you had this huge influx of children coming from, from uh, Central America. But let me just say, DACA is the place that seems to be the easiest place to start. Don't, let's don't forget, President Obama said repeatedly he didn't have the authority to do what he ultimately did. But most Americans realize somebody got brought here as a child, whether it was illegal or not, they didn't commit a crime. And these are people that are, are, are making a real contribution to our country. But it's, it's got to be a compromise. And I, th I think you'll get that done before the end of March when... Uh, when you start seeing the the extension that that Obama, I mean uh, Trump gave, expires the end of March, I think they'll get something done. Okay, we're expired here, Governor. Thanks so much <laughs> for being with us, and we'll be right back with our political panel. Joining us now for some thoughts on what's been a very unusual week here in politics in Washington, we're joined by Molly Ball, national political correspondent for Time Magazine. Mike Allen, the co-founder of Axios, and Ramesh Panuru, who is with the National Review, Bloomberg View, and the American Enterprise Institute. Welcome to all of you. Molly, I want to start with you. Uh, let's, we can talk about the Michael Wolff book, but first let's talk about the president's reaction to the book, which is happening in front of our eyes. What's your assessment of it? That to me has been the most telling part of this whole episode because, first of all, I, as a matter of political or communication strategy, I. The uh, professionals would tell you that if you ignore something like this, it's much more likely to go away. Now, there's a lot that is explosive and salacious in this book, but to engage with it in the way that the president has and to really publicly fly off the handle, if anything, substantiates a lot of the claims about the degree to which he takes things personally, the degree to which he is obsessed with personal slights and has to hit back no matter how far down he may be hitting. I mean, it's almost as if he's dropped any pretense that his first priority is his work on behalf of the American people. It's very clear that he's preoccupied, first and foremost, with his own ego. Ramesh, what do you make of this, which is the president could have said, here's what I've racked up in this last year. Uh, I've got all congressional leaders around me. We can leave Michael Wolf to himself. We're going forward. Instead, he is he has put this question of his competency by responding to it in the, in the theatrical way he has in the middle of the conversation. Why, what is that, why do that? Well, I think that we've seen this pattern play out many times during this presidency and before this presidency. One of the other things that the president is demonstrating is that he is obsessed in particular with the media. He's obsessed with the cable news coverage of him. He tweets out uh, comments about individual CNN interviews uh, in between all the times he's saying he doesn't watch that much cable news and he doesn't care about what the media thinks. He is the number one consumer of cable news. And not only that, his communications aides are out there performing for him 
they're trying to sell themselves to the president rather than trying to sell the president to the public. And that's one of the reasons I think you've got the situation where the president has this intensely loyal base but is still unpopular with most Americans. Mike, how do you read where we are? Well, John, there are factual problems with what the president is calling a fake book, uh, some of them big and some of them small. But what Michael Wolff has done is let the people in the country in on the conversation that the people around this table have every day. You can quarrel with specifics in the book, but as you all well know, the descriptions he has of the president, how he does the job, his proclivities that Molly was talking about, those exactly mirror what we hear off the record from the people who spend all day with him, including the contradiction. So the president totally trusts his own instincts, even though they change. He likes generals, but he doesn't like to be told what to do. And he lets people in on the fact that the president just doesn't read, doesn't have an attention span, and will cut you off when you're trying to explain some of the big, big issues to him. And you know, Mike, the, you're right about the off-the-record conversation that goes on around these these issues. But Molly, we also know that the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee Chairman, Bob Corker, a few months ago, raised some of these questions. In other words, did the president have the temperament for the job? So it's not just Michael Wolff, uh, who's been raising these questions. Absolutely. And the other big thing that I think Mike is right that the, that is revealed by the book is the degree to which these conversations are going on among supposed allies of the president and the people around him. And employees. And employees. And I, you know, I've, it's been a concern uh, for the White House for a while now that the president is, is surrounded by people who don't necessarily respect or like him very much. And the president, I think, is aware of that and it bothers him. And this book has really thrown that open for all to see that even the the most uh, intimate relationships in the White House are, are people who have a very different view. And so Re Republicans on Capitol Hill, at the time of the Corker comments, there was a lot of conversation about, well, people say this in private, and now here's someone saying this in public. And that has been the looming question, I think, as this presidency has continued to become more, shall we say, interesting, uh, is at what point uh, do Republicans on Capitol Hill, do more of them start coming forward to have this conversation in public. You know, we didn't need this book to have a national conversation about the president's fitness for office. What this book is doing, I think, is confirming the president's opponents in their negative opinion of the president and confirming the president's supporters in their negative opinion of the media. Right. It is a polarizing book that I think sets back the discussion. Bad, sloppy journalism that cuts corners has been the president's ally right. more than it's been his enemy. Yeah, that's right. Mike, I want to ask you about, about Steve Bannon, who uh, is a player, a central player in this book. The president denounced him this week. He's also, you've got a statement that Bannon has put out. Yeah, so this just went up on Axios. The president uh, getting a statement of regret from Steve Bannon. Uh, this is the first time that Steve Bannon has responded to the book. There's one word that's missing, a couple words that are missing from this statement. One of them is sorry. One of them is apology. He won't quite go that far, but Steve Bannon trying to hold on to his place in the conservative movement. So he's praising Donald Trump Jr., who, as you all know, is extremely popular uh, with the base. And he's saying that he has been out there defending Trump, defending Trumpism. He said he's willing to go back into the breach for Trumpism, and he says the regret, he regrets that he took so long to respond and that fed these comments. But I can tell you, this is gonna be way too little too late for the president. The president, Axios has reported, is telling his allies who go out on TV, he wants them to bury Steve Bannon. So Ramesh, this is in some sense palace intrigue and, um and useless, except this was the president's senior advisor, was there with him in the campaign, and also had some ambitions about how 2018 would play out, Bannon backing sort of more Trump-like char characters in, in campaigns, as he saw it, than, than the establishment. Do you think this matters, or is this just palace intrigue? There still is a Republican Party establishment that is not in love with Donald Trump, even though it is allied to him, and what I think the net effect of this Bannon controversy is, is to bind that establishment more closely to the president. They hated Steve Bannon. They are happy to see him marginalized and isolated, and they are cheering the president on as he does that. They are speaking with one voice with the president in saying, let's get rid of this guy forever. Okay. That's a great point, and related to that, in the palace intrigue, who is this victory, who is this book, a clear victory for? 
Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump. Javanka, as Steve Bannon calls them in this book, they wanted him out. They said they didn't trust him. Uh, the president had said that he thought Steve Bannon was a leaker, and it all turned out to be true because what's so fascinating about this Wolf book and why more of it is true than the White House is letting on is he did something that is very rarely done, and that is he just took a lot of off-the-record comments and printed them. And I think this was uh, clearly Which, a by the way, that ain't that's that ain't by okay. Hoyle. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> Under any well, and it hurts Hoyle or anyone else. Good journalists right. who honor our agreements with our sources. I mean, that's deeply when well, he seems to have printed things that he heard rather than things that he corroborated and checked out. But what you don't see in that Bannon statement is I didn't say that. Right. Like, Bannon right. comments he has he has he has he has sort of reversed himself in some ways. He hasn't taken it back and he hasn't said he didn't say it. So that part of it clearly holds and up. And the, the Bannon thing does matter because to the degree to which Trump had someone creating a vision for him, creating an ideology that was unique to him, that was Bannon. That, that came from Trump's gut, but it was Bannon who was putting that into a theoretical framework. With him gone, I think there's much less of, of a root for that. But electorally, a lot of the cat is out of the bag. The, these primary challengers already exist and are turning some of these primaries, particularly in a place like Nevada, into a referendum on the, the Trump party versus the traditional Republican party. Bannon's bark was always worse than his bite in terms of having challengers in every single state, uh, but the challengers are already there in some and, places. And the reason that uh, Steve Bannon isn't denying what he said, and not many other people have either, is Michael Wolff has dozens of hours of tape. And a lot of that tape, the people thought it was off the record, but it is on tape gives you li very little place to go now that it, it's out. You think the president's on any of those tapes? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but this is an important point, that the pushback has been broad and not specific, which, uh, which, which is a, a and, point in Wolf's And the thing that's totally bogus about, sorry, uh, just real quick, the thing that's totally bogus about their pushback is he did have the access. He was over there all the time. He was sitting in the West Wing when the other staff found out that Comey was fired. He was there. Yeah. Right. Right. Ramesh, it, it, it reminds me in a lot of ways of the Ed Klein books about Hillary Clinton, but the difference is that nobody thinks that he was anywhere close to the Clintons, uh, whereas Wolf, yeah, he was in there. He, and this was a period in the White House where things were a little uh, loosey-goosey. Um, Mitch McConnell seemed very, very happy uh, about uh -huh. Steve Bannon's uh, rough patch. Why is that important? Right. I mean, it just gets back to my point about the party establishment being bind, binded closer to the president and being very happy about, uh, about Bannon's absence. Bannon wanted to take down McConnell. One of the things he wanted from the candidates he was backing for the Senate was their pledge that they would oust McConnell as the Senate Republican leader. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you. An extraordinary book. We'll be hearing about this undoubtedly for more than just this week. And we'll be back in a moment. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.